Greetings to each one in Christ's name. It's a pleasure to be gathered together. I enjoyed our Sunday school discussion, just seeing the different perspectives. There's a lot in scriptures, and there are some that are some passages that are more controversial. And it's good to study the word, to see what what does the word say. Our sermon today is entitled What is Christian Faith? Very simple title. And yet I think the word Christian or the term Christian faith doesn't have a whole lot of very good definitions. Um, we, we know what faith is. We, we grasp with this. This is a real foundational part of who we are as Christians, and yet can we put a good definition to what Christian faith really is? And so I'd like for us to think about that, and we'll be looking at a number of, quite a number of scriptures and at a foundational piece, what, what is the foundation for Christian faith but I think of um, walking into the Christian faith. There are, there are things that we need that bring us along the faith. And sometimes our faith feels weak. And sometimes we use terms like strengthening our faith. Um, and the Lord has given us promises that we can really rest on. So I'd like to look at that. Hebrews 11 verse 6, kind of an opening text here. Hebrews 11, verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so this, this thing of having a Christian faith, what is it for? Well, I think at the source, we're seeking to understand who the Father is, we're seeking to align ourselves with the Father, but we're seeking to please the Father. And we can't please the Father in any way if we don't have faith first. Uh, there was a small boy riding on a, on a bus going home from Sunday school, and he was really excited about the little card that he got. Um, the card said, um, have faith in God. But as the bus drove along, he lost grip of his card and it fluttered out the window and he said, bus driver, stop. I lost my faith in God. And so the bus driver stopped, and he got out and got his card. And some people snickered and said, uh, oh, to have, you know, the uh, personality of a little child. But others were thinking, um, maybe that is kind of what some of us should be more concerned about. Do we have that uh, deep tenacity of we want to seek God. We want to not let go of our faith in God. And so for this boy, uh, it was important to find his faith in God or his card with the faith in God in it. So we'll start a little bit with definitions. When I'm talking about Christian faith, I'm not really talking about an optimistic attitude while taking foolish chances. Okay, there's plenty of that in the world. There are people who like to take chances, and then they try to comfort themselves by being very optimistic, and they pump themselves up and pump other people up while doing something quite foolish. And Christian faith is not about that. I'm not talking about a particular feeling or a mood. Um, sometimes we, we use the word faith more as a feeling or a mood, but this is not what we're talking about here. If I say, you know, I, I have faith that you all came prepared this morning, I, I don't really know. I'm kind of using the word faith more like a hope. I hope you prepared. But this is not hope. This is something bigger than hope. Um, it is also not trying to do good and then hoping for the best on the judgment day. We're just going to really try our best. We're going to try to be good people, and that's what faith is. No. Faith is much bigger than just trying to be good and hope for the best on Judgment Day. Um, if we take a look at faith in a dictionary, and I'm looking at an old definition, 1828 Webster's Dictionary has two that I'll pick. There's, a, there's about nine of them. And the first one is belief or assent of the mind to the truth of what is declared by another. Resting on the authority and veracity without other evidence. The judgment that what another states or testifies is the truth. 
And then in theology, the assent of the mind or understanding to the truth of what God has revealed. And we're really going to look at a lot of what God has revealed in scriptures. And that's what we rest our, our belief on. And when our belief is resting on something that is real and that really is, and we believe that that is, then we have something strong to rest upon. It goes on to say, simple belief of the scripture, of the being and perfections of God, and of the existence, character, and doctrines of Christ, founded on the testimony of the sacred writers, is called historical or speculative faith, a faith little distinguished from the belief of the existence and achievements of, say, Alexander or Caesar. So, we're really looking at what really is. And the scriptures tell us what really is. We have another scripture, and we'll, we'll cover that later. I'm not going to go there now. Um, that talks about what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And so, what is that substance? What is that thing that we can really put our faith in or our belief in and we can be solid sure, we can really know that this is real? So, before we go there, I'd like to uh, look at a foundation. I don't think we can truly understand this Christian faith if we don't have the foundation of repentance. And repentance kind of has three aspects that we experience if we become uh, converted and we follow Christ. The first one is an intellectual aspect. This is a recognition that we have sinned and that we are completely helpless and that we have personal knowledge of sin, not just sin in the group, we have personal knowledge of sin and we acknowledge that. Paul mentions coming to know his sin through the law. And I think none of us would have any, really any understanding if we didn't have some knowledge, some understanding of the law or of the Word of God. And so, we would have very little conviction of sin if we never looked at ourselves in the mirror of God's Word or God's holy law. So, aspect number one is intellectual. It's something that we realize in our mind. And then it's emotional. Emotional repentance is godly sorrow for sin. It's something we feel. And in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10, Paul mentions how he is grateful to see how godly sorrow led the church to repentance. And he's rejoicing that they repented because this godly sorrow, what did it do? It actually produced life. But worldly sorrow produces death. And so this is an emotion, something that we can actually feel. And then the third aspect is volition, which is relating to one's will. Um, repentance brings us a real change of purpose. It changes the way we see things. There's an inward turning from sin toward Christ. Godly sorrow must lead to something of a spiritual nausea that compels us to desperately seek Christ and His salvation. The sorrow itself is not repentance, but sorrow that leads us to turn to Christ is true repentance. And so, let's take a look at Acts chapter 2. Here we have a, a brief story, an account of how conversion was happening in the early church. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Peter and the, and the apostles were preaching, and we'll begin in verse 37, Acts 2. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. When those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayers. We observe the steps. There was preaching happening. 
Peter and the apostles were preaching the word. And next, the Holy Spirit was convicting. And there was contrition for sin. And then there was repentance and faith. They turned to God. And then there was Christian baptism and Christian discipleship and fellowship as they fellowship together. So this process of repentance is multifaceted. But when we experience it the way God designed it, we will find ourselves belonging to a new group of people and to a new God. And within that belonging, there comes a sense of understanding and growth and a place where we can really rest ourselves as we grow together. So we're going to switch now back to the idea of Christian faith. I'm not using the word faith alone. I'm kind of putting that together and saying Christian faith, what is it? And I, I think there are four essentials. Uh, I've taken these four essentials from J.C. Wenger's book, Introduction to Theology. But if you think of faith as something that we rest in, something that we can put our rest in, the first thing would be Christian faith involves an attitude of confident trust in God and His Word. Do we have a confident trust that God is absolutely real, He really is, and that we can put our trust in Him 100%? And it is, is His Word just as real to us? Or do we begin to have doubts either about God or about His Word, and we don't know for sure if we can really, really trust it? And I know in life sometimes we face things and as we face life circumstances, sometimes we're, we're tempted to doubt about God leading us or God being present in the situation. But if we can start with the foundation, is God real? Is He real for you? And are you able to put your whole confidence in God? And if you can put your whole confidence in God and you can really trust Him, then come what may, He will be with you and He'll, he'll see you through. We know Abraham was kind of the man of faith. And for many years, when I read the story or thought about the story, I always wondered what Abraham was thinking when he took Isaac up that mountain and he left his servants and the donkeys behind and they took the wood and Isaac and they went up to a separate place and he was going to offer Isaac. And this was a huge test of faith. And yet Abraham had this solid confidence that God was going to provide a way and I always wonder what, what Abraham thought God would do to provide a way. But Genesis 22 verse 5 actually gives us a really good clue. And in the New Testament, we have a number of verses. So Genesis 22 5, I'm going to read this verse. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. He was going up there to offer his son. And he had his knife, and he was prepared to kill his son on the altar. But before he went up, he told him, we will come back. It was only the two of them. And in the New Testament, we have Hebrews 11, verse 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it, is, it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham had this deep faith that God would provide a way, and he sensed that God would, if, if God would bring it to the point where Isaac was dead on the altar, that God would raise him up. Do we have that kind of faith that when we follow God, we can do whatever he asks us to do, and we know he's going to provide a way? even if what we feel like he's asking us to do is just counter to everything that makes sense to us. Do we have this attitude of confident trust in God? Hebrews 6, I'd like you to turn with me to Hebrews 6, verse 13. Here we have another promise, the certainty of God's promise. Hebrews 6, 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, 
Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability or unchangeableness of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So here we have this picture of us turning to God and we have put our hope in God and we've run to Him and we know that we can find refuge in God. But in this passage, we're also given the substance. We have something that we can look to and it is Christ. Christ is who we base our hope on. Christ is the substance of our faith. The second aspect that I'd like to look at of the Christian faith includes a continuing self-surrender to God. When we come to God and we repent, we're converted, we have to surrender to God. And that's the only way to come to God and to let go of ourselves, leave everything behind and ac be accepted by God, receive His gift, but as we go on in life, we discover that we have many choices to make. Every day I can make new choices, and some of my choices may not align with God's will. And so there's this need for continual self-surrender. I surrender myself again and again to God. If we think back to Abraham, it was not enough for Abraham to only give himself to God, as it were, in repentance. He had to live in continual relationship with God in a surrender to His will. And so when, when God made promises to Abraham, he followed him, he obeyed him, and he listened to him. But at some point, we know Abraham did some things that weren't part of God's plan. He had a son, Ishmael, through the maidservant, and that was not part of God's plan, and things didn't fall into place as they should have. And he took things in his own hands. Was, if he would have continually been able to remember I need to continually surrender to God. God has a way in this. And in that, there's a path forward. And, and Abraham did. He, he relied on God. He turned back to God and accepted that God has a path for him. James 2, verses 20 and, through 23. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. When Abraham believed God, there was, God looked at that, and he accepted him, and God called him righteous. To be saved is glorious. But the Christian faith includes more. It is necessary that we maintain a life of holiness. And I think that life of holiness and obedience kind of goes along with being surrendered to Christ. And this is an aspect of our saving faith. The third thing, Christian faith involves a longing to please God. Already mentioned earlier from that verse in Hebrews, um, as we turn our lives over to God, and as we fully surrender, there's something different about what we want in life. And I know that we still face it. I face it regularly where I realize I have desires, and these desires want to push me a certain direction. And I have to remind myself, are my desires being surrendered? And is my desire really to please God? Is that the top desire, to please God? And if we have truly been converted, we will have a desire above all else to do what God desires us to do, to be what God desires us to be. Acts 24, verse 16, uh, Paul spoke about this, and I, I like his example. 
he says, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. As he walked life and he dealt with the passions and the desires, the, the things that the world wants to offer, he realized I need to constantly ask myself, is my conscience in such a way that I can live right before God and God will accept me and I have a clean conscience, a clear conscience. But he didn't do it just for God, he did it before man as well. He lived in such a way that men would not be offended by his life. This Christian faith takes on an attitude of belonging completely to Christ. It's a sense of belonging. I'm not valuing my own will anymore, but I'm giving my body, my soul, my mind, and spirit, everything to Christ. And when I give everything to Christ, and I do it in faith, God can be pleased. And we can live in a way that pleases Him. The fourth one, Christian faith shows obedience. And it ignores consequences desiring only to step forward at the command of Christ. In other words, he who has Christian faith does not live on the basis of prudence. He does not reckon with selfish outcomes. He serves God out of sheer love for him, asking only for grace to perform whatever God asks. And I think of that, and sometimes I feel like my love for God isn't that strong. And when I, when I focus back on God, who is God? Who is this God that I am serving? It helps me understand where my love really ought to be. We have plenty of distractions, but can we turn our love back to this love? And when we serve God out of sheer love for Him, that's called obedience. But it sounds different than obedience. Obedience sounds like something that's being forced. It's not. Obedience is something that just flows out of a love relationship. Michael Sattler wrote a uh, track um, it was called Two Kinds of Obedience. I'm only going to read one paragraph. It's a lengthy track, and you would do well to read it sometime. You can find it online. Two Kinds of Obedience by Michael Sattler. He begins this way. Obedience is of two kinds, servile and filial. Servile has the idea of um, being subject like a slave and doing something as a slave, submitting like a slave, and filial has to do with the longings of love and connection. The filial has its source in the love of the Father, even though no other reward should follow. Yea, even if the Father should wish to damn his child, the servile has its source in a love of reward or of oneself. Filial ever does as much as possible apart from any command. The servile does as little as possible yea, nothing except by command. The filial is never able to do enough for him, but he who renders servile obedience thinks he is constantly doing too much for him. And this helps us realize that it really needs to be flowing from a life of love. And when we truly understand what God has done for us and there's true Christian faith, it's not putting something on. I think there's plenty of hypocrisy around in the world where people live a certain way, even put on certain values, live by certain principles, and try to make people believe that they are pretty close to what they ought to be. Oh, they struggle, but they're pretty close to what they ought to be. But they really have a servile attitude in serving God. And when it becomes this filial or this love relationship, it's no longer about pleasing anybody around me, but rather, am I doing this to please God? And when we serve God out of that per perspective, it brings a level of joy in our hearts, a peace in our, our lives that's not to be compared with constantly seeking to do something for myself to make me feel better or to serve myself so that I can have what I want. It's a very, very different perspective. Christian faith is not based on the quality of our own faith as if to inspect whether my faith is sufficient to save me. It focuses in its object, God Himself. So Christian faith is based on whether God is able, whether God's promises can be trusted, and whether God can deliver me from sin. Think of this example about the Israelites. 
before they left Egypt, they were supposed to put blood on their doorposts. I'm sure there were some who put the blood on their doorposts and went to bed really, really nervous. They did not like this thing of a death angel coming through the camp and wiping out the, the firstborn. They knew what was going to happen. They had been warned, and they had put the blood up. But do you think they just went to bed and just relaxed and sang glorious songs? Now, there may have been some of those. That's, that's showing of some kind of deep trust and faith that God is absolutely going to take care of us, and we did what He said, and He's going to take care of us. But I'm quite sure there were those whose faith was weak, whose faith was not that solid. But was the firstborn saved dependent on how strong their faith was? Or was the firstborn saved based on the fact that God had promised something and they had placed their trust in God even when they felt weak, weak in their hearts? They felt really nervous and scared about this. And if that's what we do with our faith, and we sense my faith is weak, my faith is small like a mustard seed, and we ask, Lord, increase our faith, and yet we can remember it's not about my faith. If I have enough faith to reach out and say, yes, God is able, and you can keep reminding yourself of who God is, you'll find a place of rest, and He'll carry you through. Back to Hebrews 11, verse 6, the verse we read in the beginning. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I'd like to close with Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25. I won't make a lot of comments on this passage. It's an exhortation for us. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us, through the veil that is His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, by exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I invite you to stand forward of prayer. Father, today we're grateful that we can come and rest ourselves completely in your ability, in your existence, and we can trust in you. And we come saying, again, we realize we need to surrender ourselves, and we need to walk in obedience, but this is because we love you. And so today, Lord, we acknowledge that we love you, and that as we move forward from this house into our homes and into our workplaces, we want to love you and serve you and show what a great God we serve. Bless us today and keep us in your care. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.